your host today uh, for our webinar with uh, some good friends of mine, John Jansen and Phil Singleton. This is the uh, first in a series of uh, webinars that we're going to be giving at Nimble to inspire and educate you about how you can become better, smarter, faster in your business. And one of the critical things that we all need to do as a business is drive eyeballs into our websites because ultimately the number of eyeballs directly is uh, related to the amount of people that you convert into people that you can help grow because I believe that's what we're in business for is to help other people grow and one of the best people I know about helping people grow is my good friend John Jansk and his co-author of the new book on SEO for growth Phil Singleton John and Phil good morning hey thanks for having us John and welcome everyone you bet yes, thank you, you bet. So much I'd like to talk a little bit about both of you. I, I feel very uh, honored to have you both here today. SEO is like black magic to many people, but ultimately it's not. It's not that hard and that today we're going to give people some simple facts that they can take away and, and help to really improve the traffic to their website. And I'm excited to have Phil Singleton here today. He calls himself an SEO grunt. He's been obsessed with tweaking websites and search engines and conversions for a long time with his company that he operates out of Kansas City called Kansas City Web Design. And he's a web prep, WordPress expert, plugin expert. He's written a number of books on it. Uh, Phil will be in the background answering questions as John presents in the foreground. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much. Um, and then we've got John Jansk. John Jansk has been teaching small businesses how to market and grow their businesses for a long time. We've been friends for a while. I count him as a, a real friend beyond just the business aspects. I love that he and I share a uh, passion for family, outdoor, food, and frolicking. But what I really admire about John is he actually has built an army of marketing teachers called duct tape marketing and duct tape selling and he's built a platform that actually teaches other business people not only about how they could be better at marketing and sales but how they could actually make money by teaching other people about that and so I'm excited to have John here and uh, John thank you for your friendship thank you for coming to teach people and you got the ball oh thanks so much John and you know that 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 one of the things so great about Social media, and of course, you know, I'll give a little plug for the Nimble tool. Is that you know, you see a lot of my love of food and outdoor family because it it all gets pulled into your little Nimble app. There, my my pictures on Instagram and my tweets and my Facebook adventures, uh, which I love to do, uh, you know, as I'm traveling around. So, uh, quick little little plug for Nimble there for that. Um, you know, I'm going to comment on the questions a little bit uh, or the poll questions a little bit before I get started. The <clears throat> I don't know about you, Phil, but I was happy to see there was nobody in the advanced category, um, you know, because they they asked harder questions, and so you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna demystify for everybody else a little bit here. Uh, right. Next thing, uh, uh, there was a quite a spread, you know, ge geographic scope, some local folks, some regional, some national, and part of the reason we asked that question is because everything we're going to talk about today applies to every one of those categories, but there certainly are some some nuances or even flat out practices that apply more to local as well and I would encourage you those of you on, on local uh, to, to really dig in and some of the work that that I've done and Phil's done uh, and certainly some of the work that we have in the book SEO for growth applies very specifically to that sort of subset of SEO if you will uh, and this is the shameless plug before we get into uh, educating your brains out um, that uh, everything we talk about today can be found in the book SEO for growth uh, you can find it at SEO for growth dot com um, I'm gonna tell you at the very end when we're doing a Q&A uh, how you uh, the, you Kindle uh, unlimited users you uh, Amazon Prime users can actually get it uh, get it for free right now so let's start with a few myths and I think that that's uh, a good place to start when we talk about SEO because there is a lot of confusion and misconception about uh, what SEO is um, and I think you know I, I left this one blank SEO is because there are about 10 things that uh, I'm sure Phil and myself could could say that it is but the one that I, I actually did an interview yesterday uh, and the person asked me now is, is SEO even still relevant you know do we do we, now in the age of Google and content and social media you know SEO is really you don't even need it anymore right um, and that's certainly a myth we want to want to turn over uh, very dramatically 
It has changed. It is no longer the black art, you know, under the hood trick Google uh, SEO, but it is probably more significant in your overall marketing strategy than it ever was. Again, a lot of people think about SEO as just being tricks and that they have this person over here in a room that, that is siloed away from the rest of the marketing department doing the tricks. Um, and then that's what makes, you know, pages rank and websites rank and nothing the truth. I mean, it is just an elemental part of marketing. It's uh, it's integrated with content and it's, it's integrated with your web design. Um, and it's, it, in fact, I, I'm not even sure we need to talk about it in some cases as a separate channel of marketing. It's just part of what we do today. SEO is all about buying links. You know, there was a day this was true. <laughs> Actually, you could really make a site uh, rank by uh, finding a, a network or a, a shady directory that would sell you a link and, and Google paid a lot of attention to the volume of links that you had linking back to your site. They didn't care so much where they were from. Well, they kind of caught on to that. Obviously, their whole their whole desire is to show if somebody turns to a search engine, types in a phrase, they want to make sure that that person gets the best, most useful, most relevant content. And so, everything that they do is is not to make sure that it's hard for you to to uh, to get your site listed. Everything they do is to deliver a great result. And so, they've gotten very good at weeding out those types of link buying things. Links back to your site are still very, very important, but you better make sure the quality is there over the quantity. Social doesn't help SEO. I think there's a lot of people that think, well, gosh, I'm, I'm doing social media and I'm doing email marketing, I'm doing advertising, so you know, I don't know that, that I need to worry so much about SEO or that those things don't lead to me getting better search results. And Frankly, they're all woven together. You know, I used to say that the that, that content and, and social and, and SEO were dating, you know, but they're, they're flat out married at this point. And uh, you, you actually can't, you can't, I think, impact your search engine optimization without great content. And what, so, what social does so effectively for SEO is that it creates engagement with your content. Those, that engagement creates shares, it creates links back, it creates signals that the search engines factor in to, so that they know, yes, people are talking about this content, they're sharing this content, they're following this content, um, and that uh, certainly does play a role. It's not the only role, uh, but it certainly does play a role. And then finally, for a lot of people, it's just SEO is too darn hard. There are, I often say, and I change this number every time I say it, uh, it's for impact only, <laughs> but there are probably 2,137 things that uh, that you can factor into SEO. And you'll find some, some uh, um, blog posts out there that talk about the thousands of factors that are part of the Google algorithm. But frankly, there are only four or five things that if you master those, if you focus on those long term, uh, you are going to do better in SEO than your competition. You know, SEO, search engine optimization, is not an event. It is a long term, ongoing, everyday practice. And that's really what we want to talk about today. So what is SEO for growth? So many of you uh, think about the term growth as a strategic word. You know, the, the title of our book is not SEO for clicks or SEO for traffic. It is SEO for growth. And, and that is intentional because of, of the place that I believe search engine optimization lives today. Uh, it is a tool for us to certainly get better search engine results when done well and combined with content and combined with a, a great web design. But it's also a way for us to understand who our ideal client is, to understand what their intent is when they go out there searching, maybe to even understand the journey that they take to find products and services like ours. And, and if that uh, sounds like strategy to you, uh, that's because it is. So let's get into what we're going to talk about, the, the, the fundamentals that I believe you need to master. So there really are four. Uh, you need to understand your keyword strategy. You need to understand, uh, use that keyword strategy to understand what people actually are looking for and how you're going to then build that into your website um, and how you're actually going to build an editorial calendar around uh, that uh, content strategy or keyword strategy. Uh, certainly there are things 
on your page, on your pages that help uh, search engines understand what the content's about, not trick them, but help them understand uh, what the content is about. And then finally, uh, getting people to share your content, getting people to link back to your content is a lot more like networking uh, than it is uh, the some sort of art of going out there and buying and tricking the search engines. So we're going to break each of those down and I'm going to ask Phil to kind of jump in on, uh, give his uh, thoughts on, uh, on various ones as we get into this. Uh, but uh, let's talk about keyword research. This is a this is you know any SEO person who's been uh, promoting search engine optimization for more than ten minutes uh, start knows that you start with keyword research. And uh, I'll give you the you know the the textbook definition. It's a practice search in, of of SEO you know professionals use to find the actual search terms that people enter into search engines. And that term actual is really key. Uh, what we want to first understand is how do people look for our products and services. And, and quite frankly, um, the, over the years that I've been doing this, uh, I, I've had more than one business owner very surprised that referring to their product or service or uh, a solution in one way, but nobody really searched that way. Um, and and the, 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 the way in which uh, their competitors were perhaps talking about it was actually the way uh, that people went to a search engine and typed in you know the phrase so our our goal really in keyword research is to try to narrowly define kind of our list of important keyword phrases that we're going to optimize our website around but also use as a, a driver of all of the content that we're going to produce so I'll just give you quickly, you know, how I kind of try to start up, start with this, you know, eight to t eight to twelve terms that we are going to use to to optimize all of our content and our website around. If you think about it, you know, there are twelve months in a year, and a really simple way I have found uh, with a lot of business owners who are really overwhelmed by all of these various new channels uh, is to think about, you know, are there could you identify a theme for each month? of the year that you would use as, as the editorial foundation, say, for your content. Now, we also may want to optimize and, you know, let's say you're building a new website. It's a tremendous place to start. Instead of starting with what should the colors be and the design look like, we want to start with, you know, who are we trying to attract and, and what is it that they're looking for. So for a lot of people, just sit down and make a list, brainstorm. There are probably eight or ten themes that you could come up with uh, just with your team. But there are also a couple other great places uh, that you, you might look to find this. Um, you know, one of my favorites is uh, the, is to go online into forums. So whatever your industry is, uh, type in the term forum plus your industry, and you will, in some cases, be surprised <laughs> at the wealth of <laughs> information that you can find this way. What you're looking for in these forums is, you know, what are the questions people are asking? What are the hottest threads? What seem to be the things where people, you know, really keep returning to because they can't get uh, that question answered. What, how are they saying? What are the phrases they're using? It's just, I can't tell you exactly what you're looking for there, uh, but I, I will tell you that in many cases you can find great keyword suggestions. You can even in some cases find great uh, topics for blog posts. I mean, if there's a question that seems to get asked a lot in these forums, uh, ding, 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 you know, write a blog post about it. Another great place to look is Wikipedia. So, uh, you know, I work with a lot of small businesses, and in some cases, these are businesses that I'm not that familiar with. I don't know their industry necessarily. Um, and so Wikipedia and the table of contents for just about any term or phrase, in many cases, can turn up great categories of or, or themes that you might uh, think about uh, optimizing or using as a theme for your site. So. Again, we're still just in brainstorming here, but I typed in the word marketing, and, and so, you know, uses of technology in marketing, services marketing, right time marketing, guerrilla marketing, you know, these are all terms that I might think, hmm, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I'm going to investigate those. I'm going to put them in my brainstorming list, and I'm going to investigate, um, and, and let's, you know, find what kind of traffic does go to those. Now, another little thing that's probably the simplest uh, tool is that you know, Google actually gives you some clues about uh, some other search terms. If you, any of you have done this, and sometimes you may find it annoying because it uh, has suggestions that don't have anything to do with what you're looking for, but I started typing in the word referral marketing or the phrase referral marketing, and it starts giving me, uh, suggesting, it, it thinks it knows where I'm going, it wants to make it easier, but one of the things that we know is that these terms are actually very often searched 
terms around referral marketing. So all of a sudden, in a very, very quick way, Google is showing you um, terms that are related to the, the main topic that you wanted to use. So Phil, you want to jump in on any of the, the uh, of those suggestions? No, I mean I I, I do going back to the um, to the um, organic search results. I mean certainly going into the autofills a a um, a great place to start because I also believe they're trying to steer you towards commercially viable terms, right? Because their whole end game is really to try and make sure that they show results that are that are going to be useful to the user for one, but also that you know that people are cl clicking for in terms of, of AdWords. So you know their end game, I think ninety percent of the revenues or more come from some version of the AdWords platform. Um, so really paying attention to what comes up in the autofill results I think is important. Also down towards the bottom of the page you get the related yeah. search results which I think are also really interesting. And I don't know if I'm, I can't remember if I'm jumping ahead to a slide on that one. Nope, nope, um, nope. But at the bottom of the search results page you'll often see related searches. I think that gets to be really important because um, where things that you do in keyword research that John's going to show you pretty soon here and even things that you see here in the autofill um, are, are usually showing kind of what's going on in terms of um, the past weeks or months and they're mm -hmm. kind of showing you okay here's what the, here's how the behavior has been down towards the bottom what we notice is in the related search terms tends to be a little bit more about what's trending now um, so when you go down to the bottom of a search result page and see that list of six or or nine um, or whatever they show you at the bottom in terms of what other people are searching for that can also give you a really good clue on on what types of um, words to, and phrases to key in on and to make sure that you're including those into your, your content marketing plan. Awesome. So a lot of what we're trying to do here is, is this is just our brainstorming list. We're just going to some of these places to think, okay, yeah, that, that's a good prospect. Let's put that on our list. So maybe we've got 20, 25 terms here. We probably want to whittle that down because you know maybe some of those will be subsets of subsets and they'll be good blog post titles, but they, they, they probably aren't going to be our major themes. What we want to do then is turn to the Google Keyword Planner. Um, everybody has access to this as part of an AdWords account. Um, I will say that Google is starting to limit the unfortunately the data that they reveal uh, unless you are an actual AdWords advertiser. Um, it used to be free for anybody to use and I think that they found that 85 percent of the use came from people that weren't buying advertising. So it's just another sort of subtle way to get more people to buy advertising I suppose. Uh, but uh, it, it deal, does still give you some useful data. So the idea behind this is that we're going to take our terms now and we're going to find you know what terms actually are popular by based on you know the volume that they talk about um, and so if you type in any term I put in my referral marketing term here um, it gives you keyword ideas and it also gives you ad group ideas and I, I love to start with the ad groups because it kind of it, it automatically groups things by several subtopics so it, in some ways it can give you ideas on subtopics because again as, as Phil pointed out they're trying to sell you advertising that's what this whole tool is about even though we're using it for SEO um, you have to remember that you know they're grouping these by things that they think would be good ways for you to advertise so this can also be some good clues about uh, ways that you might want to group things but it also what I also like about it is in my case if I don't want to be talking about affiliate marketing or network marketing you know it, it kind of eliminates those from me having to consider them or even think about them so as you drill into the keywords it gives you um, two things here that I think are really important to factor and there is no exact math on this it's just kind of a gut thing but I think there are some parameters to consider so it gives you monthly searches uh, but then it also gives you suggested bits remember they're trying to sell advertising so they want to suggest if you want to get that word referral marketing program your suggested bid if you were going to buy ads for it would be X. Now it, it may have nothing to do with reality <laughs> but what it does is give you some sort of um, relevant data so or relative data I should say so that you could say well gosh if people are bidding eleven dollars and thirty four cents for that it must be making somebody some money. Uh, it must be converting. I mean people that go and type in referral marketing program must uh, often buy something from the from the ads that they click on um, and that's why what people are willing to bid so much. So when we think about words that we want to optimize or phrases or, or themes we want to optimize around uh, there is a there, there's sort of a balance between we want terms that have 
decent monthly searches, but then also people are paying a decent amount for it. it. May not be the top search volume, it may not be the top bid, but it's but but we know that if, for example, marketing referral, people are only bidding 71 cents for that, there's a pretty good chance that whoever types in marketing referral doesn't have a commercial intent. So uh, again, a lot of times what you're doing here is you're just saying, okay, I'm you know, I'm going to I'm going to maybe use instead I was going to do online referral marketing, but maybe I might uh, look at referral marketing program if I per, have, you know, referral marketing programs that I sell or educate people on. So Phil, do you have anything you want to add as far as how you kind of pick and choose, you know, based on what you see here? Well, one thing just to take a step back, because I know this came up I think once before, is we're looking at a screen in Google AdWords called the Keyword Planner. So it, even though, like John mentioned, it is an AdWord, it's a free, quote unquote, free tool within AdWords. Um, it's a tool that we're using to pull out um, actual search data that we can then apply to our website and to our marketing. Um, and I think it's it just this. Whenever I look at this kind of stuff, it still kind of blows me away to this day because. Whenever we sit down, I think with new clients or clients we've had for a while and people talk about keywords, a lot of times, no matter what, we all kind of have our own bias to what we think people are searching for, right? Um, but this is gets to be really powerful to show you because it takes the guesswork out of, of actual search behavior. So um, again, we can't look at this as the silver bullet and say, okay, everybody's typing in referral marketing program. That's the money word that gets the most amount of clicks and generates the most sales. Let's spam the heck out of our website and our program. It's not necessarily that, but it certainly helps you, you know, prioritize how you're going to um, lay keywords out on your site, how you're going to apply certain on-page um, SEO words because at the end of the day I mean content you know words SEO is all about some form of written content right you've got your content on your site you've got the videos on your website that have words on that are transcribed people are for specific strings on you know in the Google search box whether or not they're using voice search or not it all kind of boils down to a word or a string of words so um, taking this information in you know kind of putting it in context to the rest of the kind of research that we do that John will talk about I think is uh, really important but yeah we, I we pay very close attention to the number of searches and then also the suggested bid amount and we're trying to usually find how many and the higher volume I guess alongside of the ones that have the higher suggested bid. So, because a lot of times you'll find maybe maybe one that only generates 20 keyword searches a month that has a, a super, you know, high suggested bid amount, which, which indicates that, um, that that word's getting a lot of commercial hits on. But if you had 200 hits a month for, for um, a little bit lower amount, you'd probably want to go after that one because there's just, it has more commercial value all the way around. So we, we try and prioritize based on the average number of monthly searches, what has the highest one, but not only the highest. A lot of times people will zero in on, oh my goodness, there's 2,000 you know, searches for this referral marketing term, but if it's only, you know, it's only 40 cents a click on average, well, it doesn't have as much commercial viability. We're not going to spend a, a certain amount of time optimizing for that word because um, it just doesn't have the same commercial value. Yeah, and, and all we're doing here is we're just trying to refine and prioritize, as, as Phil said. So, you know, we would, let's say we decided, gosh darn it, we're going after a referral marketing program, or we're going to test referral marketing strategies. We're still going to take these terms to to Google and put them in there as well. And, you know, let's see who is ranking for those. You know, maybe it's a competitor. Uh, maybe it's people that, that, you know, we know there's absolutely no way we're going to rank higher than, you know, this you know, major publisher or you know that that shows up on that page. So you're still just testing things, but but these tools allow you to refine um, and prioritize. And so, interestingly uh, enough, on that one that you just showed, I'm pretty sure that the ones that are coming up with the higher bid amount were actually um, a, two or three of the ones that actually came down on your autofill result. Yeah. So you're kind of pr proving on the front end and the back end that that um, you know we're seeing that some of the stuff really works. Yeah, that's great. Um, so what we're trying to do is kind of come up with our foundational themes, and those foundational themes will be the things that we probably design our web major web pages around, our home page, and the the three or four or five pages that are the the, the most directly you know linked off of the home page, and then we're thinking about. You know, other the, each of those phrases that might be off of our homepage um, have the the blog post titles and the other kind of supporting or relevant or related uh, search terms, so that we can actually uh, 
you know, not just not just be trying to bulk load up one page with, you know, and that's how, what's going to be optimized to rank for that term. We're going to be linking back and and reinforcing that in other, you know, relevant and related ways. So now we want to do is we want to start saying, okay, let's let's start looking now for long tail keywords, and this is just a, a search engine optimization term that really kind of. Um, if you think about a um, a really high you know on a graph a really high search volume and then as you know as the graph comes down you know terms get less and less searched you know that's kind of the tail, uh, but ultimately what we're talking about is terms that are longer in length as well. So if you think about referral marketing, you know if some somebody turns to uh, Google you know maybe four or five times a day and and types in referral marketing programs and strategies. That's a very long phrase, not a whole lot of volume, but the beauty about these long tail keywords is they have a high amount of intent. It's, it's pretty easy to figure out <laughs> what somebody's searching for when they type in an entire question or something. Um, and so now we're looking for um, the, the kind of the niche uh, terms and phrases that we're going to surround that with. So there's a couple tools uh, that, that we use all the time for this. Uh, one is uh, uh, the keyword tool.io. And one of my favorite things about this is this brings in the related data um, and keyword uh, or um, relevant or related data from uh, Google, uh, but it also uh, categorizes questions. I love questions. I, I think questions are really one of the the, the greatest uh, tools for understanding intent, of course, but also for almost almost writing blog posts for you. So so if, if you turn to a tool like this and I put in martial arts and you you know are martial arts useless? Are they effective? Are they worth it? I mean those are you know to me those could be headlines for for top for blog posts and uh, you've got a pretty good idea that some amount of people are actually searching for that. Um, Let's go to the website connection now. So we've kind of we've we've hopefully got our list of words that we're we're going to optimize around. You know, how do we then build our web site, maybe our our home page and uh, related pages, but then our kind of ongoing content? Because I, I think one of the one of the biggest points, if you come away with nothing else today, is to understand that your website design and your editorial you know SEO your content that you produce you know those are the, those, those things are so integrated and hand in hand that we have to we have to design a website with SEO in mind we have to design an editorial calendar with SEO in mind so Phil I'm gonna have you uh, take some of the, uh, the the heavy lifting in this section because I actually am using your uh, your website uh, and your homepage for a, a demonstration of how you might uh, structure a site, uh, and then we'll get into some of the uh, the on-page things, and then we'll we'll end up uh, really the day with uh, what what we call off-page or the you know the people linking uh, back and sending signals. So um, let's talk about your the the various elements of your homepage. So. This is um, just the top of uh, Phil's website on, on his homepage, and I'm just going to kind of go through a few slides that will feel like we're scrolling down your homepage, and you can just talk sure. about what was the thinking here. Okay, so you know, like to me, and any, and I, and I'm one of these guys. Like when you're um, when you're John of Nimble or John of uh, Duct Tape Marketing, you know, you guys already have our authorities kind of in your own niches, of course. Um, so you guys are out there, you've built your own website to the extent where you've got high domain authority, you've got an audience, um, you've got great rankings, um, you can publish content that tends to rank a lot higher um, than other than other folks w would have like right out of the bat. But then you've got the rest of us, maybe a lot of us that are on this phone call, even I put myself into that bucket where you know we don't have the audience, we don't have that critical mass of, of let's say links or content or audience that, that's kind of put us into that level. Excuse me, at that level where almost anything that we publish on our site is going to have more weight um, rank than than kind of the average Joe, the average company, the average local business that's got to kind of you know make sure we get every single SEO drop that we can to fill up the bucket. So, well, the reason I say that and preface it like that is because I look at SEO as one of these things where it's like, for most businesses, you know, they can't name any SEO company in their local city, or they can't name the maybe the the plumbing guy, or they can't name whoever it is, right? So they'll go, to, they'll go rely on Google and type it up and, and they trust Google to pull up the results for the, the people that um, have the trust, uh, merit, ability. That's kind of what they associate with higher search engine ranking. So 
what we want to do, and the, I think the power of SEO is that you can get great visibility because that's where a lot of the action is right now without having to invest a whole lot in the traditional outbound marketing or brand building and hoping for that top of, of name awareness because a lot of the consumer buying habit now, right, is let's, I don't have to remember who it was, remember the phone call or remember the guy's um, phone jingle or whatever it is. I'm going to search Google and go right to it. So there's a lot of power in, in getting your site to show up in first page results because there's 5.5 billion um, Google searches per day now. The thing is, though, that is once you get that precious click, what's that precious position on the homepage, that precious click, when they land on your site, you've only typically we've only got about 20 or 30 seconds for a new click to our website to convince people that you are the right choice, right? So what we try and do, and again, I pulled this in. I was one of those guys in the past I think was um, trying to do the back office tactics to try and get um, higher rankings without having to do all this other stuff. And now I've kind of moved in, become a duct tape marketing consultant and tried to work in, into my whole marketing plan where I can get people to know, like, and trust me as quickly as possible. So how do I do that on, on a website? Well, it doesn't matter if it's my website or a client website or a home services website. To me, when somebody lands on your website, you got to get them to know, like, and trust you right away. And you, you've got to instantly show them what your unique selling um, proposition is. So in our case, somebody types in Kansas City SEO, we come up first on the page. Okay, great, that looks good. They land on the website. What am I going to show them right away? I'm going to tell them right at the very top, very clearly, without being too, too messy, here's my main message, here's my phone number, here's my call to action. So they know exactly what I want them to do when they land on my homepage without having to scroll any further. So it's really clear. This can apply to, I think, any type of business. In fact, before we started this call, I was scrolling through um, the Nimble homepage, and I think when we scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see a lot of that no like, and trust here that I have on my own site. It's very similar to the way the Nimble um, site set up and some of the duct tape sites and whatnot. So as we scroll through the next down low, I've already got you on. You landed on the page. I showed you where you wanted to go. You got my call to action. Now I'm kind of down in the middle of the page here where I think a lot of people miss this. A lot of websites are going to miss where they don't put enough anchor static content on the home page that's got some of those core keywords that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out which ones are most important for our business so typically you're going to want to put 200 to 300 maybe even 400 words or more um, on your website that that gives Google kind of that core text to hang on to um, that doesn't change because you get a lot of websites that try and keep their their front end too clean. They actually don't have any keywords on them. In some cases, people are trying to move towards like full sliders with very little. They want them to be. They don't want people to scroll. They're afraid they won't scroll. Um, they don't want too much text on the homepage because they they feel that um, it's too busy. Um, but we know. In fact, I think we've got some quotes in the book where you know the the pages that tend to rank higher. When I say page, I mean a home page or an inner page or a blog post. The pages that tend to rank higher on Google are the ones that have more content on. So you wouldn't be want to be afraid to have um, that kind of content in your home plan to explain what you do because you've already got your main message at the top. Now they're kind of digging in. Let's show them some other things where they can know, like, and trust us. So um, another part, I've got two parts of these on my website where I try and show people who don't know who I am why I am a better choice than anybody else that they click on. The first one I do at the very top is I show some of my customers that people here in and around town might know, might be familiar with. So again, I'm, I'm showing them I'm, I um, – I'm, I'm increasing my trust factor on there because people say, hey, there's somebody that I've recognized around town that's been around a while. John, at Nimble John, you do the same thing at the top of your website. You've got some um, places where you guys have either been um, reviewed or people that you've worked with at the top there. So again, once we land on trying to figure out what it is that you guys do right at the top there, I can see where you've worked or where, where some of these um, other trust factors are. In our case here, I've got places where you know we've written or distributed content. Again, trying to get that know, like, and trust. So by the time you scroll from the top to the bottom, I'm showing you these factors that not only help people convince them that, that, that you know this business is a good choice for them, um, it gets them to trust as well. Now, down at the bottom, I think a lot of people also miss this. I think we want to give Google um, as many reasons as we can to crawl our website so that they have a reason to keep coming back and keep indexing our content and keep checking it for, as, um, for content that's the answer to people's problems. So blogging to me is almost kind of the heart and soul of all of SEO, all of digital marketing, because you, you put it on your website, especially here, I've got a feed on my website where if I didn't have this, my homepage would be pretty static and Google would be less likely to crawl it because there are, there are fewer changes that are going on, on onto a homepage. So I think it's important for most, for most businesses, small businesses, again, businesses that don't quite have that 
um, authority critical mass that some of the influencers might have to have a blog feed on the homepage that's consistently pumping fresh content and changing that homepage in a way that forces Google to come back and check to see um, what has changed on the page. So we've talked about really the uh, the kind of the structure, you know, the layout. But uh, there are some things, and that I'm going to ask you to you know talk about these as well, Phil. There are some some elements that are some you know under the hood. I mean, some that that most people don't actually see, but that again help Google or whatever search engine understand what the content is about, and so consequently help. You know, rank it for what it's about, um, and these you know typically SEO folks will call these on-page uh, elements, and I think that uh, the, there are some core ones that uh, no matter what people say, I think uh, still today in 2016 are pretty important. So I've got them listed there. You want to kind of go through uh, the the various elements? Yeah. So this is um, we've actually had in the last boot camp that we have we actually go through a WordPress site where you're kind of looking in the back end and we're actually showing you exactly what we're talking about. You know, but in terms of maybe a headline, or I'm going to call that probably um, a page title, um, that would be, if any of you are familiar with like the Yoast plugin, um, you have the ability to set your browser title. Uh, there we go. Let me say this. So, you know, in terms of a headline, we're talking about a headline for the or a headline for the, the actual title of a post is one thing, but that is also kind of ties into what you would put in terms of your your SEO title for the page. So Yoast is a great plugin here because it actually shows you there at the top. You get a little look of they're trying to show you here's what it would actually look like if it showed up in a Google search result. So we see the blue link text that's, that's familiar from a Google search page, and you see the the green um, URL tag. You also see the meta description, the the gray te the two line text down below. Um, you want to make sh and again, so we go in and if you're if you're not doing your strategy and you're not doing your keyword research ahead of time and you all of a sudden are starting to kind of arbitrarily drop in titles and not don't have that SEO mindset because if you don't know what your core 20 to 50 keywords are then you really don't know where the finish line is and all of a sudden you start doing content or doing certain types of, of digital marketing tactics that are kind of just hip shots in different direction but having that core keyword um, list and starting to kind of incorporate it in the right pages places on your website so you're always kind of thinking about what those end goals are then you can start to kind of craft titles and and start to um, place these keywords naturally in in the right place in the website so that you get the most amount of on-page um, credit from Google so I don't know if we skip back to the other list because I think this was the next one forward so the headline I'm going to tie together and with a title our headline for a say a blog post or a page the URL, we know that we can go in and actually add keywords or um, uh, edit the URL title of a page or a blog post that we put. So kind of syncing those up in for, for a, a certain keyword are going to be really important. Um, the titles, meaning the main title and also even some of the subtitles are also important. So like when we go into, say, a blog post in, in um, WordPress, we want to make sure that we're using subtitles where we can and we're actually applying header tags. Go on, I might be getting a little bit technical here. We actually go in and name your headline an H1 tag, name your subtitle an H2 tag, and the, the more that you tag um, the, your, your, your keywords and your titles on those blog posts, uh, the more on-page signals that you're giving to Google um, that are going to help your overall effort in getting that page or website to rank. Uh, the description, again, maybe just skip back to that uh, or go forward to the Yoast box. The description here we're talking about up at top, You've got the, a local SEO rankings guide to great listings for your business. That's going to be the SEO title that we're going to signal to Google. This is what we'd like to, if you rank this page, we'd like this to show as the blue title. Down below in the meta description box, which I would call that the description, which again is something that you would set in through a plugin. It's not pulled out, typically not going to be pulled out randomly through your page if you set this. Um, this is really important because, and I mean that gray section there, if you are a local business, you must focus on local SEO, yada, yada, yada. That, text is technically not used by Google to rank um, your page or your website. Where it's really important though is to have a, co a compelling meta description because if your search shows up on a search result page on Google and you have a compelling description there that's got some kind of call to action or something that's um, interesting enough to compel that person to a click, you will increase your click-through rate for the page. 
Now there's some controversy in this. I do believe that the higher your click-through rate is through Google, that means somebody types in your website or your address, you sign up and they actually see your, 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 your web page as a choice to choose on a search result page. If they search that term and your website gets clicked more often than the other choices, a lot of people in SEO believe this is a, a direct SEO ranking factor. Google denies it, but a lot of us see that there's at least a pretty high correlation with it. So spending some time on this description to get to, to write something in a way that compels people to kind of pull them in is going to be helpful for your SEO overall as well. Yeah, and one of the things that um, uh, if you're using WordPress, it will create a title and it will create a URL and it will create a description. But the default is just whatever your headline is. Uh, that's the default URL. That's the default title. The description will be the first, um, you know, 170 characters or something of the blog post. So it does all of this. But what this plugin does is allows you to intentionally change every one of these elements so that it optimizes the page. And so that's why it's so important. So let's go to our. Uh, networking activity. So um, I'll throw out a couple of mine, and I know Phil has some great uh, ideas on this as well. But you know, your local strategic partners, could you write content for them? Could they write content for you? The associations that you belong to. Um, a lot of people forget that they went to a university and that they belong to three business associations, and there is a civic group that, that has a directory. Those are all really powerful links and typically free and easy to acquire and very relevant. I mean, Google sees those as, as uh, useful links back to your. Finding links, uh, you know, using tools that allow you to look at your competitors and find out you know, who's linking to them. In, in some cases, in fact, quite often, uh, there are sites linking to them that are industry sites or, or places where you could actually very easily acquire a link as well. Uh, using your content to, to again, you know, guest posting, things of that nature is a great way, probably my favorite way to get links back to my site because they're, if I can target high authority, high traffic sites, I can generate not only a link but a lot of traffic as well. And then just places where you contribute. You know, every community, almost every industry has a an industry newsletter or magazine or a, a local you know community business paper that uh, that in many cases has an online um, version uh, maybe exclusively online and a lot of times the content is all contributed so you know finding those places where you could actually contribute to that that are relevant to your industry again all great signals all great links so Phil I know you uh, you, you've mastered this art of, of this idea of SERP stacking, yeah, I, <laughs> and so well, uh, maybe think, you can talk a little about it. Sure. I mean, link building, like I say, is really, it's one of the most, if people hear links, they still hear to this day in volume versus quali uh, right. qu uh, quality. So, but, so links are like super, super important, um, but you really don't need that many uh, from high quality, relevant, trustworthy sites to help you, and that's especially true if you're a smaller business in a in a niche or a local place, of course, the, the the more competitive you are, the bigger your business is, the bigger the players are. It gets a little bit harder. But for a lot of people, if you just focus on on just your own network, John, as you're saying, I'm going to give you a perfect example. I belong to three chambers here in Kansas City, right? I pay them annually a, a relatively small fee. I don't know, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars a year. Um, where most of the f uh, focus on a lot of chambers is still doing kind of the traditional print advertising for their flyers or putting events together, that's great. What people don't realize, and most of the people here even in Kansas City that belong to chambers is, you know, we get a press release or something to release, you can actually go up onto their site and say, hey, please, you know, please post this for me as member news. Within that member news link, please link back to my website, right? So that's three ways that people don't even think about to use like some of their existing partnerships. And anybody that you, you would pay money to, I consider that like a chamber, an association. If you do any type of local or niche advertise, uh, magazine advertising, a lot of those guys will, if you ask them to, to give a sponsored post to or even um, link to your website, they'll include that as part of maybe your print advertising. Um, great ways for you to get, again, niche links back to your website just by going out and asking. We do a lot of 
very targeted, selective um, cross guest blog posting for clients um, here, like like locally. So, for instance, you might have like your plumbing client um, cross blog post with your luxury home building client in a way that adds value to that um, to that other. Uh, audience so that you get that free social connection towards the other guy saying hey this XYZ um, plumbing CEO is advertised as um, has a great educational blog post on our site the plumber then gets access to the to the home building social media channel so it's great advertising you know social uh, word of mouth value in it but you're also getting if you do it right a nice high quality backlink from a local um, uh, website that's that's in your niche in a way that makes sense. I think the main thing about any type of link building is you have to be proactive about it now, but you also, the golden rule to me is to make sure that any place that is linking back to your website, you want to be proud of the website that it's on and you can explain how it got there, meaning you didn't pay for it, you earned it um, through content or through outreach or through some kind of um, a partnership relationship and not there to game the system. If you go through link building this way and just kind of work your own relationships, you can actually get, you don't need too many of these. I mean, we're talking about 30, 50, maybe 100 if you're a smaller local business. You can really get locked down this um, ranking factor, which is still, it's not the silver bullet, but it's probably still of the 200, 300 plus heavy ranking fact factors that Google has. It's probably still one of the most important ones, but it's also the most scrutinized. And I have a, just a screenshot of a tool called Ahrefs, and we're going to end today just talking about a few tools. But uh, um, this is a great tool I know that, Phil, you use for stealing. Uh, you, you, I'm, I'm half kidding, but you know, going to a competitor and understanding you can use this tool to research your competitors and, and what, where they're getting all of their links. And in some cases, that can be a great signal for maybe some uh, potential places where you could actually get a link as well. And so you know, totally. some of these kinds of tools or another one of my favorites is called BuzzSumo, uh, which is uh, it not only shows you the most highly ranked and shared content, uh, but it also shows you who linked to that content, who shared that content. So let's uh, end kind of here's my, my list and Phil, to correct me if there's any you want to add on to here, but you know the Google Keyword Planner is, is free, it's a must. Uh, KeywordTool.io I talked about, uh, there is a free version, but uh, for a little money you get a lot more data. Uh, BuzzSumo is that uh, search engine content, search engine that shows you the most shared content. Uh, SEMrush is a great tool to, to, to really, if you want to spy on your competitors for their advertising, <laughs> um, I think it's probably the best tool for that, uh, for their online advertising. Ahrefs is a great way to, to understand who's linking to you and, and uh, who's linking to your competitors. Rival IQ is, uh, I didn't talk about that today, but it's a, it's a great tool from a competitive research standpoint to, to see kind of how you stack up in, in SEO and SEM and, and social. Uh, with competitors and and obviously you know there there are fans of nimble on here today uh, a, another really great tool to understand better understand your universe of, of clients of prospects of really influencers even that's one of you know one of the ways to kind of get links is to is to understand you know people who already write about your industry and and to kind of see what they write about and what they talk about in social so that you have a better way to uh, approach them. You know, again, another great way to, to get a link in, as well as traffic. Any you want to add on there, Phil, before we go to questions? That's, um, nope. Yeah, that, we that we can talk about mind. tools all day, but, you know, right. I didn't overwhelm people. <laughs> you know, John, I want to add one thing. This is John Ferrara. Um, in regards to understanding your customers better, Ultimately, we're using all these tools to get eyeballs to our websites, but ultimately we want to understand the people who are visiting our websites, and there aren't many tools that will uh, take an email or a name and layer identities on them and their company and bring the data down and then give you insights into that. And one of the things I really dig about our new Nimble platform is with our uh, automatic enrichment on people and company, you can now build segments and one of the cool things about our quick filters and their areas of influence, it'll tell you what areas of influence the people you're attracting to your website have, which means what their interests are and then we rank and sort the highest occurrence of those interests, which means that you'll have the top 10 keywords that your prospects are interested in, which you could utilize in the future. So there's some, there's some other interesting things that I learned from this webinar that I want to actually go and start trying immediately. I love, love, love the webinar. Let's get the questions. Awesome. So yeah, um, 
Well, we'll uh, I don't know if you're going to field the questions. You want me to just uh, kind of toss them out? Uh, um, obviously, some have come in. If you're on the call now and there's some things that uh, you want to know the answers to, please uh, post those in the questions. Um, I did mention at the uh, at the top of the webinar that uh, a great deal of the everything basically we talked about is written in uh, our, our newest book, uh, SEO for Growth. Um, and if you are, you can find it on Amazon, or you can uh, check a little more out at SEOforgrowth.com. But if you are a uh, Amazon Prime user, uh, you know the, about Kindle Unlimited, and so uh, you can actually get the book uh, for free um, on uh, as a Kindle Unlimited. So, John and Phil, I found a few questions here. One of them is, can you talk about how stop words change your SEO success? Mm. Yeah, Phil, that one's right up your alley. I honestly, I, I know a lot of people talk about this and have opinions on it. I don't, um, I don't really worry about them too much. I actually were, and I'll give you, another, I'll even take this a step further. When I set up my um, URLs within WordPress for like a blog post, I actually tend to add them back in because I believe that although there could be a slight um, the slight disadvantage, I guess, to using stop words to where for whatever reason people think that's true. I think you pick up more by having a clear, um, in terms of a call to action within the, within the URL. It makes yeah. more sense to actually have the URL be part of your uh, the description than it does to try and remove it. So if somebody's got a blog post in there and they remove the the, the the or the and, I think it actually takes away from a message that you could actually be using on Google search results to to say something to somebody. So right. that would be my answer. I really don't adjust stop words in terms of how I implement my keywords on onto web pages or through my content. We have another question here. What's the main difference in strategies for local versus international organization in regard to SEO? Well, I'll take a little of this and then Phil, if you can add anything. I mean, the biggest thing is that for local, that probably the most important element now for local has become that three pack or that, you know, map listing. You know, so many people locally are, they're looking for a product or service. They're out and about already. They're doing it on a mobile device. And so showing up in that, you know, three pack with the directory listing uh, is, is kind of the holy grail, I suppose, for, you know, for local. And so, uh, ratings and reviews are important. Um, you know, local citations and having making sure that that you don't have like phone numbers and wrong in two places and addresses because you've moved. So, you know, a lot of, of focus on local, much more localized content uh, is is important. You know, where it's not so important for somebody that's trying to sell all over the world. So, those are a couple of the key factors. Yeah, local is pretty much its own beast. I know when we start talking about companies that are national, maybe international, um, it depends on if they have local locations, local offices, because um, in that case, and we have a little bit more time we would spend maybe on page to be like, okay, one of the bigger problems that we've seen with some, for instance, national, international companies that have local offices is they treat their other office addresses almost as just kind of directory listings on their website, where I believe you should localize those for um, local searches. So. In other words, I wouldn't just have a page. I wouldn't necessarily always just have one page that lists five addresses. I would have each location, maybe have its each location page. So it's got a landing page, so it can have its own maybe Google Maps address. So you're actually kind of creating a mini website for that local office, and then you've got a chance for it to maybe show up more um, for local searches or for people that are more uh, in that proximity. Um, so there are some things that come in because because I guess my point is you can use. There are ways to do national and maybe even international SEO at the local level because you still want to try and yeah. compete for the root terms nationally, but there's also some ways where you can win nationally at the local level if you make sure you can kind of line everything up and get as much of that local search volume as possible. Yeah, and, I, and you know, a lot of times people will just will if they're a local business, your Google My Business page is really important. But I think even for a national business, it's still another great ranking signal with authoritative data that Google can take in. So you don't want to just dismiss some of the local practices if you're a national or international business. John and Phil, there's a request to get the access to the slides afterwards. Yeah, um, so that, I'll leave that to you guys uh, because you're going to share the recording. I'm more than happy for you um, um, and, and we have sent the slides, so I'm more than happy for you to share the slides. Great. Um, as I part of that. What we'll end up doing is probably doing a blog post and uh, summarizing the presentation, putting a link to the video, 
and attach in the, the slides. But what we'll also do is uh, we'll send a link to the video immediately afterwards and uh, and facilitate those slides as well. Just uh, a couple notes. Also. There was a question I'll take to the to, very quickly. Um, there is Amy no audible version. Book um, as of yet, but um, you know we ought to we ought to look into doing that, Phil. I know a lot of people like to listen. Sure, I was going to say on page eighty-one of the book, we actually have a very detailed outline of the keyword SEO research for Keyword Planner, yeah. and it literally takes you through how to set it up from go to this AdWords and here what to fill in. Um, there's also at the end of the book, I think it's page one ninety-one or so. We actually have like a list of here are the tactics that you should employ from how many you know suggested some suggestions on how many blog posts to do per month um, you know structured data a recommended amount of social media posts for some businesses so I mean it gets down to that level of here's kind of what a um, a an, an kind of a content marketing slash content driven SEO plan would work would look for you know a smaller medium sized business. Well, John, I think we've exhausted our hour here, so I, maybe you can take I, I us wanna, out. I want to thank you guys for taking yeah. the time to get up on our nimble soapbox and inspire and educate people about how they can become better, smarter, faster at driving eyeballs to their website with SEO for Growth. I can personally say that I learned a lot, and I'm excited to go start playing with some of these tools to see how our nimble website is doing. John and Phil, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks guys. So much for tuning in.